Hello. We are going to be reading the very end of Black Beauty today. Um, so I have really loved reading this book. I know a lot of you um, have been really sad reading the last couple of chapters. Um, unfortunately, that's just, um, you know, part of how a lot of these animals were treated um, with cruelty, like we saw with Nicholas Skinner in the last chapter. Um, thankfully, Black Beauty found his way out. Um, the farrier spoke up for him so that Black Beauty wasn't going to be killed, even though Nicholas Skinner thought that's what should happen. So um, we're going to find out about the horse fair um, in this next chapter and uh, um, yeah, finish up the whole story. As we talked about kind of earlier in the book, um, there's a lot of comparisons between this and um, between the way horses are treated in this book and um, that the slaves were treated um, in America and other countries, um, that a lot of people were just focused on making money and didn't care about um, people's lives and how they were hurt. Um, so it's sadly just part of our history. Um, and it still happens today that there are people who uh, um, mistreat people and animals. And this book hopefully has made you kind of sympathetic, more sympathetic for animals and other people who go through pain. Um, so, uh, yep, we've got two chapters left and we'll see who ends up purchasing Black Beauty at the horse fair in chapter 48 that we're about to start. So if you have a book, um, you can follow along with me. I'm going to present my screen so that you can um, read it from the screen if not. That was the last one. Okay. Well, and there's your hint already. The chapter is called Farmer Thoroughgood and His Grandson, Really. So, and as you can see, My Last Home is coming up as the last chapter. Okay. So, at this sale, Black Beauty says, of course I found myself in company with the old broken down horses. Some lame, which means they had, um, they were injured or they were unable to walk altogether. Some broken winded, some old, and some that I am sure it would have been merciful just to shoot, which we saw with Ginger before. The buyers and sellers too, many of them, looked not much better off than the poor beasts they were bargaining about. There were poor old men trying to get a horse or a pony for a few pounds that might drag about some little wood or coal cart. There were poor men trying to sell a worn out beast for just two or three pounds rather than have the greater loss of killing him. Some of them looked as if poverty and hard times had hardened them all over, but there were others that I would have willingly used the last of my strength in serving. They were poor and shabby, but kind and human with voices that I could trust. And obviously they're all human, like literally human beings, but he means they're really trying, um, they have a good heart still, and they're looking out for other creatures. There was one tottering old man who took a great fancy to me, and I to him, but I was not strong enough. It was an anxious time. Black Beauty's thinking, who am I going to be sold to next, another person like Nicholas Skinner? Coming from the better part of the fair, I noticed a man who looked like a gentleman farmer with a young boy by his side. He had a broad back and round shoulders, a kind and ruddy face. Ruddy means he's been out in the sun a lot and he's been out kind of working in the farm. And he wore a broad brimmed hat. When he came up to me and my companions, he stood still and gave a pitiful look round upon us. I saw his eye rest on me. I had still a good mane and tail, which did something for my appearance. I pricked my ears and looked at him. There's a horse, Willie, that has known better days. Poor old fellow, said the little boy, Willie. Do you think, Grandpapa, he was ever a carriage horse? Which Black Beauty was um, at Squire Gordon's. Oh, yes, my boy, said the farmer, coming closer. He might have been anything when he was young. Just look at his nostrils and his ears, the shape of his neck and shoulder. There's a good deal of breeding about that horse. He put out his hand and gave me a kind pat on the neck. I put out my nose in answer to his kindness. 
The boy stroked my face. Poor old fellow. See, Grandpapa, how well he understands kindness. Could not you buy him and make him young again, as you did with Ladybird? Oh, my dear boy, I can't make all old horses young. Besides, Ladybird was not very, not so very old, as she was run down and just badly used. Well, Grandpapa, I don't believe that this one is that old. Look at his mane and tail. I wish you would look into his mouth, and then you could tell. Because, um, and this is where we get a couple of expressions, like, don't look a gift horse in the mouth. Because people can actually tell the age of a horse by their teeth, how long the um, teeth are. They actually get longer, the older the horse is. Strange enough. So, um, it basically, the don't look a gift horse in the mouth phrase means, um, if you get a gift, don't start to judge it and think, oh, I don't know about this one. I wish I had gotten this instead. Just be grateful for a gift. Um, so they're looking at a, this horse in the mouth for a good reason. They're really trying to think, is this horse really old? Is there still quite a few years of his life or not? Um, so it's, uh, little Willie says, I wish you would look into his mouth and then you could tell. Though he is so very thin, his eyes are not sunk like some old horses. The old gentleman laughed. Oh, bless the boy. He is as horsey as his old grandfather. And to be horsey means actually that you just know about horses a lot and you really like horses. So Willie is actually giving really good advice. He's saying, look in his mouth. Figure out if he truly is um, very old because I don't think he's that old. Do look in his mouth, Grandpapa, and ask the price. I am sure he would grow young in our meadows. The man who had brought me for sale now put in his word. The young gentleman's a real knowing one, sir, he says. Now the fact is, this air hoss is just pulled up, pulled down with overwork in the cabs. He's not an old one. And I heard as how the veterinary should say that a six months run off would just set him up right up, being as how his wind was not broken. I've had the tending of him these 10 days past and a gratefuler, pleasanter animal I never met with. And twould be worth a gentleman's while to give a five pound note for him and let him have a chance. Um, so it's just gonna be five pounds to um, purchase Black Beauty, which is really, really cheap. But it's because Black Beauty has gone through so much that he's very weak. But he's gonna gain some strength if he gets some rest. I'll be bound he'd be worth 20 pounds next spring, he says. The old gentleman laughed and the little boy looked up eagerly. Oh, Grandpapa, did not you say the colt sold for five pounds more than you expected? So he has an extra five pounds, just enough to buy Black Beauty. You would not be poorer if you did buy this one. The farmer slowly felt my legs, which were much swelled and strained. Then he looked at my mouth, 13 or 14, I should say. That means 13 or 14 years old. Just trot him out, will you? I arched my poor thin neck, raised my tail a little, and threw out my legs as well as I could, for they were very stiff. What is the lowest you will take for him, said the farmer as I came back. Five pounds, sir. That was the lowest price my master set. "'Tis a speculation," said the old gentleman, shaking his head, but at the same time, slowly drawing out his purse, which is just his wallet. At this, this time, it was like a coin purse, um, so it's not girly. But um, he's saying it's just a speculation, meaning it may be that Black Beauty is actually a very old horse and he's about to die. And so this gentleman would just waste five pounds by purchasing a horse that's about to die. But maybe he actually can just give the horse some rest and then sell him for a higher price later. He says, quite a speculation. Have you any more business here? He said, counting the sovereigns into his hand. That's the money. No, sir, I can take him for you to the inn, if you please. Oh, do so, the gentleman said. I am now going there. They walked forward and I was led behind. The boy could hardly control his delight. And the old gentleman seemed to enjoy his pleasure. 
I had a good feed at the end and then and was then gently ridden home by a servant of my new master's and turned into a large meadow with a shed in one corner of it. Mr. Thoroughgood, for that was the name of my benefactor, the one who uh, just purchased him, gave orders that I should have hay and oats every night and morning and the run of the meadow during the day. And you, Willie, said he, must take the oversight of him. I give him in charge to you. The boy was proud of his charge, which means his responsibility. He's got a lot that he can do for this horse. And he undertook it in all seriousness. There was not a day when he did not pay me a visit, sometimes picking me out from among the other horses and giving me a little bit of carrot or something good, or sometimes standing by me while I ate my oats. He always came with kind words and caresses. And of course, I grew very fond of him. He called me old, old crony, as I used to come to him in the field and follow him about. Sometimes he brought his grandfather, who always looked closely at my legs. This is our point, Willie, he would say. But he is improving so steadily that I think we shall see a change for the better in the spring. The perfect rest, the good food, the soft turf, and gentle exercise soon began to tell on my condition and my spirits. I had a good constitution from my mother, and I was never strained when I was young, so that I had a better chance than many horses who have been worked before they come, came to their full strength. During the winter, my legs improved so much that I began to feel quite young again. The spring came round, and one day in March, Mr. Thoroughgood determined that he would try me in the phaeton. And the phaeton, let me look that up again. I, it's a type of cart. Let me present this picture. Oh, well, now it's a type of actual car. But here is what they're talking about. It's a form of sporty open carriage popular in the late 18th and early 19th century drawn by one or two horses. Very light, but on extravagantly large wheels. Okay, so they're going to try him in the phaeton. Oh, I lost my spot by switching over. Just a moment. I was well pleased, and he and Willie drove me a few miles. My legs were not stiff now, and I did the work with perfect ease. He's growing young, Willie. We must give him a little gentle work now, and by midsummer, he will be as good as Ladybird. He has a beautiful mouth and good paces. They can't be better. Oh, Grandpapa, how glad I am you bought him. So am I, my boy. Remember, he wasn't sure if Black Beauty would actually get any better, but he's so pleased now. But he has to thank you more than me. We must now be looking out for a quiet, genteel place for him where he will be valued. Okay. So one more chapter is all we have left. Now, Black Beauty is back to better shape with the help of Farmer Thoroughgood and Little Willie. And now they're going to try to find a gentle place. Excuse me. Sorry about that. And they're going to try to find a gentle place for Black Beauty to really have a good home. They're going to try to make some money off of him, but they also want to specifically look for a nice gentle place. What do you think it's going to be? We actually have an old character that we know from earlier in the book that will come back in this next chapter. So watch this next video and I've got some questions for you to answer and I will see you soon. Bye.